Oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, hey. <laughs> You're uh, you're you're inside of the seat. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> there you go. The avatar doesn't. These seats are so bizarre. Yeah. All good. So have you seen any other? It's very quiet in here. It is very oh. quiet in here. These oh. things. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was something wrong hey, folks, with the audio. Thanks. We're, we're, just deal we're just dealing with a couple of audio um, issues, but we'll get started in just a moment here. Thank you for your patience. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there it is. Uh, um, I was going to say, uh, yeah, my, my brain is just filled with so much Metaverse, Web3, I'm coming NFT, back. I'm coming back. blockchain. Awesome. I looked up some of the links you recommended. Thank you so much. Oh, cool. What, um, did you join the discords and stuff? I started to, but again, there's just so much right now. I've still got to kind of, I'm still kind of processing, putting it together. Welcome back, Ray. Yeah. Yeah. Hey there, Odank. Hey there. Hi. Are are you all connecting from Austin or abroad, uh, from abroad or other cities or? I'm in Seattle. I'm, I'm in Seattle. In uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Hey, 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 Lynn. Where are you at? Hi. Hi. Oh. oh. Um, I'm from Taiwan. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Odank, where are you? Yeah, I'm in Austin. Yeah, I'm, in Austin. Um, uh, I'm getting feedback through your mic, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm in Austin. Uh, I yeah, saw this talk, and so um, before going down to uh, South by Downtown, I thought I'd come check it out and see how it's going. Oh, cool. Has Anyone, have you all been able to check out the XR experiences uh, through your headset? Like, do you have to be in Austin to experience <laughs> some of the things that are Lovely. going on? Can I get a quick audio um, check on your side, please? Sure thing. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I hear you great. Amazing. Hi, everyone. Oh. Off the stage. I don't know if you can hear me. The seats don't seem to be working quite properly. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sunk. <laughs> You've become the seat. Yeah, I have. <laughs> I mean, also, it's the avatar. She's so small. Uh, my other one works fine. She she kind of crosses her legs, but this one just kind of, like, sinks in. <laughs> um, yeah. You're okay. You're okay. You seem to be in a seat to me. Yeah, I, I feel yeah, like I'm in see. a seat. I feel like I've become a seat. Okay. <laughs> Hi, can you all hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. One more test. Can you all hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for hanging tight while we dealt with some technical issues. Most of us, including myself, are 
new to the social VR environments, but they are super exciting and fun as we work out all these kinks and issues to have so many of you in the metaverse to talk about these amazing, impactful projects um, in a new format. So, of course, with that, sometimes comes some technical issues. So, again, thank you for your patience so much. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce this incredible project and team and story. Um, so, without further ado, I will let them take it away and explain because they can do it so much better than I can. But this is Awaken, a deep dive into On the Morning You Wake. Um, and first, we'll, I'll play a trailer to start the conversation. And missile imbalances? Yeah, we just got it too. As much as you know, that's how much we know. The Pacific Command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. If you are indoors, stay indoors. If you are outdoors, seek immediate shelter in a building. Remain indoors while the wave from windows. On the morning we wake to the end of the world, your vision will be 2020. So use it. And maybe, just maybe, the world may not have to end again tomorrow. Do others in the space see the, the trailer playing? I don't know. On the morning you wake to the end of the world, Take your body back to the kai, to the place our kupuna taught us life began. First pole, then coral, then slime. Uh, yeah, we could see it. Or I, I could see it. The morning you wake to the end of the world. Take your body back to the kai, to the place our kupuna taught us life Morning, you wake to the end of the world. Take your body back to the kai, to the place our kupuna taught us life began. First pole, then coral, then slime, then a whole universe fitting into a space smaller than a grain of sand. But I don't know if that's the distinction. 911, please fire ambulance. I just got an alert on my phone saying there was a ballistic missile inbound. Yeah, we just got it too. As much as you know, that's how much we know. The Pacific Command has detected a missile threat to Hawaii. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. This is not a drill. If you are indoors, stay indoors. If you are outdoors, seek immediate shelter in a building. Remain indoors while well away from windows. On the morning we wake to the end of the world, your vision will be 2020. So use it. And maybe, just maybe, the world may not have to end again tomorrow. Yeah, well, we can see it twice, or is it the second time we're not here? If someone in the audience just wants to call out when the trailer is finished, because speakers for some reason can't see it. Uh, yeah, it's done. Uh, it's done. Uh, yeah, trailer oh, yeah. finished. I think we've seen Great. it three times. Thank you very much.
<laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, great. So Rachel, why don't you take it away? Sure. Um, so can the audience hear me? Is someone? Yeah, yes, perfect. indeed. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you for joining us today um, to uh, for this uh, panel that is part of project of On the Morning You Wake, which is the trailer that you saw today. I'm Rachel Bronson. I am the president and CEO of an organization called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And I'm delighted to be here today uh, virtually with you, uh, with Cynthia Lazaroff, who is joining us from Hawaii. Ray Acheson. Ray, are you coming in from New York? Where are you coming in from? Yeah, I'm in New York right now. New York. And uh, lovely Mayim, who goes by Bombshell Toe. And are you in Washington, lovely? No, I'm actually in Venice, California. So on the in west Venice, side. California. So it's early for yep. you as well. Thank you. So we're delighted to be with you here today. Um, and the topic couldn't be more urgent or more important, given what we're watching, all watching in the Ukraine right now. And so maybe I'll start with a first um, kind of scene setting uh, question to Cynthia. Um, Cynthia, we're all focused on what's happening in the Ukraine, and it seems so unbelievable that we're talking about nuclear weapons, something that seems to, uh, that should have been relegated to the Cold War. Those of us on the stage know we've been talking about this uh, regularly. But for you in Hawaii, you had a searing experience in January of, tw of 2018 that you then, from your own personal experience and your own expertise, wrote an article about uh, in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists that also that incident helped spawn this movie. So Cynthia, maybe just introduce yourself via your background and then tell us a little bit, remind us what happened in Hawaii uh, just a few years ago. Thank you, Joel. It's an honor to be here with you and all at South by Southwest joining us today. Um, it's really a moment all together and thinking about this right now is, um, is so important. I, I am the founder of Nuclear Wake Up Call Dot Earth and Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy. Um, so your question, Rachel, uh, go back to January 2018. You might remember that this was still during the fire and fury Donald Trump jung on and here in Hawaii tensions were particularly high as he knew that he was marked as a nuclear target on North Korea's map of nuclear death. We were getting instructions from our local government at that time about how to prepare for a nuclear attack, how to survive a nuclear attack. And I was working on a film at the time, and it just did interviews with dozens of top experts on nuclear dangers in the United States and Russia, and pretty much everyone I had spoke to had awakened me to today's staggering nuclear danger. And the two who had the greatest impact on me were our former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev. And Secretary Perry said to me that today we're at a greater risk of nuclear catastrophe than during the Cold War and that most people are blissfully unaware of the danger. And then he said we're allowing ourselves to walk in nuclear catastrophe and we must wake up. So I, I realized at that moment when he said that that I've been sleepwalking into the end of the Cold War. So all of this is what was going on with me personally on the morning of January 13, 2018, when I was one of over a million across the Hawaiian Islands all got this message on our cell phones, ballistic missile threat, inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. And so after getting confirmation from a journalist, a really trusted source, that our county government was telling us to take shelter, I spent the next 38 minutes preparing my family to try to survive their attack. So where do you go? There are no designated shelters in Hawaii. What do you take you? Where are your loved ones? Can you get to them? How many minutes do you have? Do you call to say goodbye? For me, it was my daughter in LA. And this was the moment when it all came the most real for me. As I was racing to shelter in a cave, I called her and it was ringing and ringing. And when she finally picked up, I said, Mackenzie, I don't know if you've heard or not, but we've all gotten a message on our cell phones that we're going to be hit by a nuclear missile. And I 
just want to know that I love you. And she said, Mom, I love you too. At that moment, time stopped for me. I, I didn't want to let her go. Um, I thought, will I ever see her again? Will I ever see horses again? And then I thought, is this one nuclear missile from North Korea, or is this many nuclear missiles coming from Russia to us, and many from us going back to them? Is this the beginning of the accidental nuclear war with Russia that Secretary Gary and so many of the top experts that I interviewed are so worried about? Is this the beginning of the end of life as we know it, of everything and everyone we know and love and cherish on this earth? And then I suddenly heard, Mom, go! Mom, go! So pretend all be back into reality, and I said, I love you one more time, and then started running up the hill to cave. It took 38 minutes for our government to send out a text message telling us that it was a false alarm. And even with everything I knew about nuclear weapons, nuclear war was unimaginable to me until I went through those 38 minutes. But this experience now is still with me. It lives inside of me as a mother, as a human being, and it's never going to go away until we eliminate nuclear weapons. So that's what was going on for us back in 2018, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. It's really hard to follow up that account with anything else. Um, in, in a sense, you said it all and all we need to know. Um, but let's continue the conversation. Um, Ray, I want to turn to you. So um, this uh, this film on the morning you wake, which is about people's reaction to that false alarm, um, is in VR. Um, it's being launched through South by Southwest, and they've brought along impact. They've uh, um, brought impact fellows onto uh, this project. So perhaps you can talk a little bit about your background and why you connected with this project. Yeah, um, I'm hoping folks can hear me. I'm having some audio problems, but I uh, I'm going to trust that you can. Um, so yes, I work with the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, as well as the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And my job for many years has been to work with governments that reject nuclear weapons, as well as mobilize activists and organizers around the world to work for nuclear abolition. And so when the January 18th false missile alert happened, um, a lot of folks reached out to, to ICANN and to those of us that work on this issues with a lot of questions, the same way that we're seeing right now um, with the recent threats of, of the use of nuclear weapons that we're seeing from Putin. And people asking, what would this mean? What would this look like? How do we deal with it? And the answer for activists, for those of us that have been working since 1945 on nuclear weapons, is that the only answer is to abolish these weapons completely from, from all arsenals. There are no right hands for the wrong weapons, as the UN Secretary General has said many, many times. And as others, including all of the experts that Cynthia mentioned, but also all of the grassroots activists have talked about for years, and also all of the non-nuclear armed states in the world. And a lot of my work is with governments. Working against nuclear weapons is actually, uh, you know, something that's deeply embedded for, for most governments in the world that reject these weapons, that don't see them as tools of security, um, and that see them actually as putting the entire planet at risk when only nine countries have this capacity to destroy the entire world. And so I started working with this film because I knew folks that were directly involved, that had had this experience in Hawaii, um, and also in, in being able to, to share the work that I've done with governments and activists and connect that up to the film, hoping to reach new audiences, engage new people that are interested in what you can do on a personal level and in terms of, of organizing against these weapons. Thank you, Ray. Lovely. I have a, a similar question for you. You also are an impact fellow, and so the uh, producers of this film reached out to you um, to help them amplify your message. Can you talk about your work and how you got connected to the film? 
sure thing. Um, hi, everyone. Also, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, so I actually got started um, in the nuclear policy field, researching nuclear weapons very early on. So now I've been doing this for about 10 years now. Um, and it sounds like such a made-believe job. Uh, sometimes my friends and family still sort of wonder what it means to work or research nuclear weapons. Um, but sort of my path is somewhat different in that I specifically research nuclear non-proliferation, which essentially means preventing um, countries in developing um, nuclear weapons. So how do we secure nuclear materials, facilities, components that would go in a bomb? Um, and, you know, I've had the opportunity to work in the government, academia, think tank, um, and the more I sort of do this work, um, you know, just sort of realizing to, to Ray's point earlier that disarmament is really the goal. And we sort of see it in the news right now, right? As Putin sort of threatens nuclear weapons, that, or the use of nuclear weapons, that, that sort of emphasizes the value, the military value of nuclear weapons. So when it comes to my work, um, helping governments, scientists prevent, to prevent other countries from pursuing a nuclear weapons program. You know, it's really difficult because it shows that these weapons have um, military value and that makes like our job much harder to deter um, or prevent other countries from, from developing them. So I think disarmament work and non-proliferation work go hand in hand. Um, and also in sort of my line of research, uh, especially dealing with this from a very high level, we often forget um, the personal impact of this. So I'm really, I'm, I'm really grateful to Cynthia for sharing her story, her very hard memory of sort of what happened um, in Hawaii, uh, because we often don't see these stories. Um, when we look at the news or even sort of the classics, right? Dr. Strangelove um, and, and sort of other nuclear weapons related cultural touch points or references, they often don't have like real people's experiences or, or they're rather dramatized, right? And as a millennial working on these issues that don't necessarily have the memory of the Cold War or World War II, it gets really difficult to connect with them. And that's sort of the reason why I decided to be involved in this film. I'm often really skeptical of, of um, movies that depict nuclear bombings, just because it's something that I often deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, always thinking about it, and it can be really stressful. But this film really hit home just because it's so community-centered. and. I see this as sort of an entry point for kind of opening that conversation and including, um, you know, folks like Cynthia um, in in the dialogue. So hopefully that's a good summary of of what I've what I'm doing and and how I'm involved in this film. Thank you, um, Ray. Let me come back to you. You have a piece that ran. Uh, yesterday maybe or maybe it's running today a very recent piece in the Houston Chronicle where you you lay the baseline for um, the kind of the state of the nuclear landscape and also what it means for Houston this this is taking place in in Austin obviously but why don't you talk us through some of um, what you outline for Houston to give a scope of what we're talking about Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the piece, I think it ran Saturday online and Sunday in print in the Houston Chronicle. And they reached out to me because they wanted to draw some connections for local folks in Texas, since this was premiering here in Austin. And we sort of looked at this um, nuke map simulation that's available online. And you know, you can you can see what happens to your town or city if a nuclear weapon were to be detonated. And so we looked at what would happen in Houston and the destruction that it would cause, and also relying on other resources from ICANN and um, other groups 
around the world, looking at the impacts on healthcare facilities, which of course, you know, overwhelmed already with uh, the pandemic from the last two years. Um, but even besides that, if a hospital was still standing after a detonation, which is unlikely, it still wouldn't have the blood or the beds or the burn units to provide for, for the citizens of the city. And that's, that's with one nuclear weapon. And so we're not even talking at this point about a nuclear exchange. So I wrote about that for them, but more broadly, the point was really to, again, draw the reality of what nuclear weapons are. There's, there's all this language, which is very deliberate deliberately made into, you know, something very sophisticated. We call it techno strategic language, right? Like you have to know how a nuclear bomb works um, or you have to know all of the, you know, nuclear war planning and, and military strategy and geopolitics and all of that. And it's, it's designed that way to make us feel that as ordinary folks, we can't engage in these conversations. But if you look at what nuclear weapons do, if you look at the humanitarian impacts, the environmental impacts, if you listen to the stories of survivors of nuclear weapon use in Hiroshima and Nagasaki or from testing around the world, people whose, whose lands have been tested on, whose bodies have been tested on with nuclear weapons, you can see immediately the, the physical impacts that they have and the intergenerational harms that they cause. And so really a lot of the work of, of ICANN and others working on these issues is to bring home this reality for people and make it seem like a conversation that everyone can participate in because we all have a stake in it. And so the other thing that I was trying to talk about a little bit with this article right now, of course, Putin's nuclear threats uh, are in the news. He put Russian nuclear forces on, on a higher alert status, and he threatened that anyone trying to intervene in Ukraine uh, could start a nuclear war. He didn't say that, but everybody knew what he meant. Um, but I think what's important is, is to remember that this issue of nuclear weapons isn't just about this moment, and it's not just about Russia's nuclear weapon. It's about all of the nuclear weapons, the almost 13,000 nuclear weapons that exist uh, in the hands of nine different countries. It's not that many countries that have nuclear weapons. I think that's the other thing. We think it's this, this big, massive, global problem, um, but it's really just about the policies of, of nine states and a few of their allies that support them. And the rest of the world rejects these weapons and has worked to outlaw them internationally, which I'll talk more about a bit later. And so I wanted to draw all of that going from the super local from, from Austin and Houston, going global to, to what the world looks like in terms of nuclear armament and how people in Texas and around the country and around the world can get involved um, through cities' appeals, parliamentary actions, divestment, and other campaigns to make a tangible difference in the world. Lovely. That, uh, that um, segues nicely into a question I wanted to ask you. Uh, the sense of nuclear anxiety has certainly heightened since it's been put in, on our, our screens directly. Um, in, in the last couple of weeks, you've been thinking a lot about uh, nuclear anxiety. How are you thinking about that and, and, and how can that be useful to our conversation today? Sure thing. Um, yeah, it's really interesting because I've been talking to a lot of journalists and other scholars about the resurgence of nuclear anxiety. I feel like it's something that we, uh, I guess, see as sort of throwback, right? Something that's very Cold War, something that, um, uh, evokes duck and cover and other uh, civil defense uh, programming um, back in sort of the uh, 60s, uh, sorry, uh, 50s um, uh, and 60s. And so it's really interesting to see how folks today, especially younger folks, respond to Putin's threats, um, as well as just this whole conversation about nuclear weapons. Um, and one of the things that I would want to point out is that every person um, has their different needs, different responses, right? Um, especially with the use of social media, I think it's, you know, that's something that we didn't have back then. Now we're sort of surrounded by news. Um, we see a war unfolding um, on our live streams and 
Twitter feeds, which is very difficult and, and very new to our time. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think it ties back to a lot of what Ray said, right? Um, and to my point about everyone has different touch points when it comes to feeling better. Um, one of which is, you know, there are some folks that want to turn to preparedness. <laughs> I've talked to a lot of people who just want to know what, um, what they can do, um, sort of the survival mode. Um, and to those people who, who want to uh, engage in that way, um, looking at the nukes map resource to get a sense of what that could look like in um, their, their, their cities, um, understanding what kinds of resources are out there. Um, I think it was a CDC um, who has this like, really short slogan of go inside, stay inside, um, and sort of, you know, uh, listen to the news um, or stay tuned rather. So go inside, stay inside stay tuned, um, which is sort of the most basic thing that you could do um, in the event of a nuclear attack. Um, and that's really just finding like a stable structure, making sure that you're in the center of it, not leaving it or trying to look at the window if you're worried about fallout, um, having access to sort of a hand crank radio um, um, so that you don't have to, uh, to rely on sort of a telecommunications or uh, sophisticated telecommunications. Um, so th those are obviously resources that you can find online. However, um, and I sort of also fall into this category, so that doesn't really help me <laughs> as an individual. Um, oftentimes what helps is, uh, you know, really seeing the, the long-term goal to, to what says it's not just about this moment but the larger problem but the fact that we are sort of um, held hostage by nuclear weapons that ever so often when a leader decides to threaten the world with them then now we have to sort of scramble and figure out what to do right I think that unfortunately we've sort of decoupled sort of the immediate steps one could take to prepare with sort of the activism and the advocacy of like getting rid of them and I think that that's what I would love to I guess um, encourage in the current conversation of, around nuclear anxiety is trying to find agency and a sense of resistance in what's happening with us because there are organizations that are trying to be involved um, it's not that far-fetched to um, get rid of nuclear weapons even though the nine nuclear weapon states um, including the United States and Russia um, say that it's, it'll never sort of, it, it's, it's a pipe dream. Um, obviously, there's an international law banning them already. And so I think, um, you know, I, focusing on sort of what we can do collectively and individually and what that looks like to, to be aware and find agency could also be um, really helpful. I have, you know, um, other things I want to say about nuclear anxiety, but for, for now, I'll stop there and would love to also hear from the audience later on. Absolutely. Um, Cynthia, why don't you, could you talk to us a little bit about, uh, just picking up on the theme of nuclear anxiety, how are current events playing out in Hawaii? Um, we're all attuned to it, we're all feeling this, but I suspect there's some interesting conversations happening there. Yeah, well, and thank you, Rachel, again. And, and I think that what we're experiencing in Hawaii, what my friends community here are, are feeling is a lot of what Lovely just talked about. Um, we're in people around the world are experiencing kind of the collective anxiety, fear about the possibility of nuclear war. And so I, I do have friends who are doing things that didn't do um, to prepare in 2017, 18. You know, who were um, you know stocking water and supplies and things like that. Um, but we live in the tropics, you know, and and windows always have open when most of us don't have any air conditioning so this whole idea of finding shelter you know I've, I've went to a cave before because it was sealed um, it's hard to think of being sheltered in open air wall screens that we live in here in Hawaii um, for some of us like me this has triggered our memories and trauma of those 38 minutes but we know this is different um, this isn't a false alarm this is a real life 
real-time nuclear alert that has been with us since each and is now going on day and night this is the third week of this war in Spain and we know this alarm is going to be with us until this war ends and even beyond um, and I think this is something that we share with with people all over the world as I said and and I just want to share something that was sent to me over the weekend by my friend Dr. Ira Helfand, who's a nuclear abolition abolit activist with an international position prevention of nuclear war. He sent me this quote from an op-ed written by Earl Tur Turcott, who was a Canadian disarmament negotiator, and it really hit home for Ira, which is why I sent it to him, and, and then it really hit home for me. Um, wrote, if conflict ends with annihilation of our species, it should nonetheless regard it as a planet-wide near-death experience. And the peoples of the United Nations should demand the total elimination of nuclear weapons as quickly as humanly possible, as well as the establishment of new common security measures that will move us much closer to sustainable throughout the world. So Turcotte's words, the planet-wide near-death experience, are the words that really, really hit me. Because for me and, and the people across the Hawaiian Islands, living through those 38 minutes was a personal near-death experience, um, and, and at the same time, a collective shared near-death experience. And I've actually been calling it that since the day that it happened. Um, it was the moment when what's most important became crystal clear to us, um, because we now know that during those 38 minutes, we were all trying to get to and protect our loved ones, or if they were too far away, like me, we were all calling our loved ones to say, I love you and goodbye. And, and, you know, they say a near-death experience changes you forever, um, and that many who survive near-death experiences report coming through having a much greater appreciation for life and for what's most important, which is people we love. Um, and, and this was so true for me. Um, my immediate feeling after the false alarm was, was gratitude. I had this feeling of, you know, pinching my cheeks that I'm still here. We're all still here. We're alive. And everything around me felt and looked more vibrant, more alive than before. All the colors were enhanced. My senses were enhanced. The feeling of the wind, um, you know, the sky was never so blue. The green and purple clouds, crown flowers, the butterflies flying and pollinating, everything was just this wondrous appreciation for life. And then I had this strong feeling that this was a wake-up call, this was a gift, and that, um, you know, we need to start sharing it, writing it down, and, and have to share this experience so because we've been given another chance to get right um, and, and that we have to abolish nuclear weapons coming back to what Ray said and what what lovely said that um, and I think that's what I'm hearing from my from my friends here that the moment that we're in right now is it with nuclear tensions in this war in Ukraine is another wake-up all an, another near-death experience so I guess my prayer is that this um, planet-wide near-death experience Turkett's words, we're all living together, will be an awakening, but, but not just an awakening because that's not enough, but an awakening to action to do what Ray and Lovely said, um, which is the only way out of this situation we're in, is it was to eliminate nuclear weapons. Okay, I think we have time for one more short round of questions. Uh, maybe one of the uh, organizers can tell us me if that's not true, but maybe if we can keep it tight and then we can go to Q&A. Um, Ray, let me start with you. Um, you've mentioned ICANN a few times, and you've mentioned TPNW, uh, the Treaty on the, Prohibit the Prohib Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, could you talk through a bit about what the TPNW is? Um, and again, I'm mindful that I'm asking you to do that quickly, and it, it could take a whole, whole session. But maybe you can introduce it for those uh, here with us today who don't know about it. Yeah, absolutely. So the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons was negotiated at the United Nations in 2017. Um, it's going to turn five years old this year. Uh, it was adopted on July 7th, 2017. And um, the, the sort of structure of the treaty is both a prohibition of everything to do with nuclear nuclear weapons, so um, outlawing the use and the threat of use, so what Putin has just done, um, as well as possession, uh, development, testing, etc. So everything to do 
um, with nuclear weapons is legal under this treaty. And it also provides a framework for the elimination of nuclear weapons. So the nuclear armed states have so far, the nine of them, have rejected this treaty. Um, they said they'll never join it, um, which is a confusing statement from some of the supposedly democratic governments of, that have nuclear weapons. Um, but this is, this is what their claim is. Um, and they have, they tried to shut it down. They tried to put pressure against um, the states that, that negotiated this treaty, which um, in 2017 was uh, voted for by 122 countries. So the overwhelming majority of, of countries in the world uh, have supported this treaty. Um, and the, the treaty does, like I said, provide for elimination once these countries join, once the nuclear armed states join it. So that's kind of the, the activist optimism there, right, is that um, we will compel elimination um, and they will be able to carry it out under this treaty. That's our um, ultimate goal. Um, I also don't really mind if they use the treaty to eliminate their nuclear weapons. They could, you know, do it themselves tomorrow. That's fine with me as well, as long as we abolish them. Um, but we are using this treaty to um, commit a lot of non-nuclear armed states, of course, to stay non-nuclear armed states. But we're also using it to raise awareness and to engage uh, people everywhere, wherever you're at. And so in ICANN, we have a divestment program, for example, which has worked really well um, with fossil fuels and with other uh, indiscriminate um, weapon systems like landmines and cluster bombs, um, taking money away from, from nuclear weapon production. And that is going extraordinarily well. And you can find out more info at don'tbankonthebomb.com. We also have local initiatives like Cities Appeal, getting your city and town to support um, the treaty and to call on the government to join. And that's particularly effective in the U.S. and, and other nuclear armed states. So there's a lot of ways that we're using this instrument to galvanize and mobilize public attention and support for nuclear abolition. Um, and so happy to talk more about that in the Q&A if people are interested. Great, thank you. Um, lovely last question to you. I was going to ask you about the role of storytelling in your, in your work. You touched on it, but you also mentioned that you had more to say on nuclear anxiety. And so let me just turn it over for you for a last comment from the panel to uh, structure your response uh, in, in the way that's most powerful for you. Sure thing. Um, well, in terms of the storytelling. So one of the other things that um, I do on the side while um, I, I conduct nuclear policy research is that I also have an arts collective called Bomb Shelter, um, which is the words bomb shelter and sheltos, like the Adidas shoes sort of combined. Uh, and the idea behind that is bringing different artists, um, scientists, historians, activists, um, and other nuclear policy experts like me to come together and come up with new sort of creative products, including stories, um, creative pieces to sort of tell the story of, of nuclear issues. Um, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about how a lot of our cultural reference points around nuclear weapons is dated, right? Um, they're classic for sure. Um, but uh, just more and more, it just feels like a different part of history that doesn't necessarily relate to us anymore. Obviously, that just changed with what is happening in Ukraine. Um, but there's also many different types of nuclear stories. What I really like about On the Morning You Wake is that it's uh, it talks about these close calls, you know, the human error, right? Like, I think a lot of the stories out there focuses on government basically what what putin is doing now this sort of um threat on threat at like the global theater and obviously that's that's useful in some ways but i think that there are finer issues right that i think a lot of the general public don't know about including these close calls actually in sort of the policy field they're called broken arrows and for example the pentagon has acknowledged about 32 broken arrows, like near misses or close calls. But um, an author, Eric Schlosser, who wrote Command and Control, 
found other documents that show that there are several more than just 30 plus incidents. Um, so you can really get a sense that this is not just at the leader to leader level, although that's important, kind of what's happening um, with, with Russia's threat. But there's a whole system, there's a whole bureaucracy. And I think that's what ICANN is doing with Don't Bank the Bomb is really interesting because it's a different way of approaching the issue, right? Like how can we target nuclear weapon producers or sort of contractors that obviously um, uh, get um, benefits um, from, from maintaining them, for example. So that's all to say that I think storytelling is really important and also using today's aesthetics, um, today's cultural sensibilities to tell stories is really cool. Um, obviously doing something in VR um, or the metaverse um, is going to be very interesting. Um, so yeah, that's sort of um, um, part of my work, and if that's of interest to you all, um, I can touch on it some more later. Great, thank you, Cynthia. Let me give you the last question. You, you, um, I know you said that this film wasn't inspired by your piece, but I have to believe that there, uh, it, it, it was, or it's uh, hewing pretty closely to it. What do you? Um, what would you like for people to take away from your your article that you wrote and um, from this film that is has has been debuted here at South by Southwest? Well, you know, Rachel, there's so much I hope people will take away, and I think you know, on the morning wake, so powerful. So I guess to do just a brief um, first, that people come away feeling a connection to our experience of those 38 minutes, um, what it was like for us here in Hawaii, and that they come away feeling the nuclear threat is, is personal and tangible and real, like it was for us, um, that, that, that if, they, if it could be made real and personal. Um, and I hope that the film gives people the courage, what I would say, to imagine the unimaginable, just like what we have to have right now, to make the difference. And that it awakens them to what's at stake, that, that their lives are at stake. I mean, all of our lives are at stake. Um, that this is a nuclear wake-up call. Um, and that they come away with the realization and understanding, this is something that both Ray and Lovely alluded to, and I just have to keep remembering it, especially in the moment that we're in right now, that the only way to prevent one person or nine nuclear armed states from holding the world hostage and unleash, unleashing nuclear Armageddon is to eliminate weapons. It's, it's really comes down to that. And that, that they come away with the understanding, my hope, my hope is that they, they the takeaway is they, that we all have the power and agency to do something, to change our nuclear story, and that each and every one of us can make a difference. Um, so I guess, you know, that I hope that we'll come away feeling inspired, compelled to act, not out of fear, but out of love. Because that's what this really is. This is about love, preserving life, preserving um, life for our children in the future, um, for everything that we hold dear, and that um, they will join this global movement that both Ray and Lovely have talked about to abolish nuclear weapons and support the tree on the prohibition of weapons. There's so many things that, that we all can do to make that happen. And so finally, I, I guess my hope is that we'll come away with gratitude, like I did, that somehow we're all still here with all of the nuclear risks, all the broken arrows, all the false alarms um, that over so many decades, that somehow we're all still here, we're still alive, and that there's still time to do something about it. That's my, my prayer and my hope. Thank you. I think we've come to the end of our time. I'm going to look to the organizers to give me cues here. Um, I think that we can do uh, questions. Uh, and to open up this discussion um, somehow. So uh, you all will have to lead me through that. This is the first time I'll be doing that. But if anybody who's joined us wants to jump in, um, please do. OK, 
Okay, well, not seeing any questions, I want to thank my, uh, my panelists. If you want to follow up on their work and you want to kind of get engaged, you can go ahead and uh, Google Ray Atchison, uh, Lovely Mayam goes by Bombshell Toe, Cynthia Lazaroff, my organization, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Um, we're covering this topic regularly, and it is a way uh, to get engaged. Um, with that, lovely Ray, Cynthia, any final thoughts from you? Um, well, just, you know, it's it's so interesting to hold this conversation in this space. Um, I think that there's also something comforting about humans <laughs> trying to figure out technology again together. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, thank you for taking interest. Um, you know, I, I know that you guys are probably just sort of digesting the, the information you've heard, but I'd also love to hear from you guys how you're feeling about the news, um, how the topic of nuclear weapons is sort of hitting you guys from like a personal level, if it feels confusing or distant or what have you. Um, but yeah, just, you know, just really appreciate you guys for, for showing up and, and listening to us and, and taking interest in this film. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, I guess I kind of had a, I, I don't know if it's a question, but I, I know there is this panel here in VR. And then there was also a panel with, I believe, the, the directors of, of the films and other, other related uh, some someone else from Games for Change, and um, I, I guess I was just wondering what else is are, are you all up to with the film here at at, at South Pie, whether online or offline? You said you were in Austin, yeah? Or yeah, I was going. To, I I didn't realize there was the other panel. Of, I guess it was uh, yesterday, maybe, or the day before. It's kind of hard to <laughs> keep track of the days, but I was going to go down to uh, the the in-person VR experience later today after this, but um, yeah. Yeah, very cool. I think, um, and I don't know, Raul um, or anyone from the Games for Change team want to chime in here, but yeah, I would absolutely encourage that. Um, in Austin, they are showing the first three episodes um, of of the, the film, and um, there's actually, it's sort of a group viewing situation where obviously you'll put on individual headsets to watch the the film but then as you transition to the next episode if you will there'll be opportunities to discuss and kind of reflect collectively if that's something you're comfortable with so I think that that might be a really cool way to not only see the film itself and get a sense of sort of the memory that Cynthia has shared um, uh, and she's on the film um, prominently uh, and, you know, I think that that's going to be a really nice way to intimately or physically connect with folks to just kind of process these issues. Um, I don't know if, Raul, there's specific other recs yeah. that you have on the ground. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, hi, folks. I know I wasn't um, <laughs> really part of this panel. My name is Raul Carvajal. I'm the director of production at Games for Change. Uh, we served as one of the executive producers on the piece. Um, and I had the pleasure of being on site uh, this weekend to help premiere the three chapters of our piece. Um, it's going to be launching publicly, uh, I'll just mention, uh, on the Oculus Store March 24th, I believe. So all three chapters will be available there for free. Definitely encourage you to watch them there if you can't be on site to watch them uh, this week. Uh, and if you're going later today, I do know that I think they're closing a bit early, maybe 3 p.m. Central control or so. So I'd encourage you to go um, as soon as you can. Um, but yeah, we've got a very long impact plan for this project um, that's going to be touring the world um, after this weekend. Uh, we've got some awesome information that's on our website, morningyouwake.com. Um, a couple sort of like previews of the stuff that you'll find there will include schedule for the rest of our um, exhibitions. We have a plan to showcase to the UN later this year. Also a plan to be at the Nobel Peace Center, uh, which will be wonderful. And then of course, we're um, gonna be developing strategy to release uh, curriculum and kits for local exhibitions, either by organizations or by academics or by 
students um, to make sure that this piece starts uh, fostering conversation sort of across the board, not just at the grassroots level, but also um, at the government level. So please do stay tuned. We've got a, a lot planned for the next year and a half. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And enjoy the the viewing later, Odang. Yeah, hopefully, I thought it was going till 6, because that's what the schedule said. But if they're closing at 3, uh, I'll see what I, I can manage to check out before they close. But uh, thank you. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Is there like an after party? <laughs> we can go grab a virtual beer here at the counter. <laughs> <laughs>